I just picked up a bunch of hand hatchets at the flea market. Uh, really cheap. I mean, you can find them everywhere. And to, before I can get started on using them, I have to restore at least one of them. They're all in bad shape. This one, I just made a video not too long ago. I found it over the hill uh, when I bought this house. And it's what I've been using, but I'm not too pleased with the result. I want something a little better. I'll go through them, restoring them by various methods. I'm going to do the smallest one first because it looks like an easy sharpen and I just want to get started using it. So I'm, I'll make a series of quick videos about what I'm doing and I hope you enjoy them. Before we get started, I would like to ask you to please suspend judgment. Try not to think of anything that I do here in terms of right or wrong. I'm going to give this a black walnut handle and that's probably not the most highly recommended handle type. I even have an extra hickory handle there, and I have a piece of hickory here. But I'm making the decision because that's what I want, and I'm just exercising my own personal liberty to do so. I'll get to these other guys in good time, but for now, I want to do this. Four dollars it was labeled, but I ask, you know what? It's got a broken handle, and I'm going to have to put a lot of labor into it. How about two dollars? And the person kind of rolled their eyes and accepted my offer. So what I'm going to do is give it something that resembles this. This is kind of the pattern that I'm going for. And it's kind of a copy of the old Boy Scout hammer, the plum. It's very similar. So that's the shape that I'm going for. And here is the piece of black walnut that I'm going to use. I milled it myself, and it's not the most beautiful thing, but it will be beautiful for a handle. Black walnut's not very hard, but for a wee little axe like this, I'll be able to get away with it. The grain is not perfectly straight the way that I would want it to be, but as I just said, it's a small axe, so it will be all right. And it will certainly be beautiful because it will have a lighter color on one side and closer to the side that's heartwood, it will be nice and dark. I also picked this little guy up for one dollar. Let's restore this one real quick. That's better. Okay, let's get started with the main project. Fiberglass is tough stuff. I'll have to drill it. I should point out that if you want to put an axe head in your vise like this, you have to be careful that your vise jaws don't destroy it. This is one of the vise jaws that 
came with my vise, but I replaced it with softer steel. You know that moment of satisfaction whenever you pull a splinter out? This is that moment. The hole that's already in it for the handle is, it's the same the whole way through, but I would like it to be more tapered like this. And that's so it can be bigger at the top so that when I drive a wedge in, it makes it nice and tight and it can't fall off. Ideally, I would just remove some of this metal, but I'm not really set up to do that sort of thing. But I do have some things I can try. Hey, every little bit helps, right? So how far did I take it? Well, this is what it was, which is just under 14 millimeters. And this is what it is now, which is over 15 millimeters. So that'll be enough to wedge it in there tight. Next up, I want to grind some of this mushrooming off. Okay, one side done, and almost done on this side. In general, we can think of making anything as a process that consists of two parts. Uh, maybe not making things, but sculpting things, sculpture in general has two parts to it. The first part is shaping and the second part is smoothing. This isn't a definite rule and there's no definite boundary between these two processes. But in general you can think of it as you use a really harsh tool to establish an outline, a general shape, a skeleton of what you want to make. And then the second part, the smoothing, is something like sanding where we remove the tool marks that are made in the first process. Okay, back to work. But just to encapsulate this, when you're working on making anything, try to think about which of those two processes you're actually taking part in.
sanding, shaping, it's all the same thing. This is called soapstone. In reality, even though we like to think of things as being different, because we like to quantify things, we like to label them so that we can make sense of them. Once they fit into their little box, then we know what they are and we can understand that. But in reality, call it what you want, chemistry, biology, physics, mathematics, there's no such thing as being interdisciplinary because they're really all describing the same big picture. Just specific parts of it. That's right, I'm using a palm sander. You know that, remember that speech I just gave you about qu not quantifying things? Don't think of this as a woodworking tool, think of it as a smoothing tool. And then you can get away with it. I'm just trying to knock away the scratches that I just made with this thing. Once this side is as nice as the other, then I can move on to the handle. I don't recommend doing a restore on a fiberglass hatchet, and here's why. Not as much wood goes down into the axe head. There's just going to be a little tenon that goes into it. I removed too much material right here. My excuse, um, dull bandsaw blade, camera in the way, you know, the usual. But I assure you I'm not going to lose much sleep over it. I'll just return some of this material here using wood glue and I'll wedge it in place until it sets. Later, this wedge will be a hickory wedge that will make the ax head seat nice and tightly on there. Now, a hatchet purist might think me a hacker, but that's okay, because the experienced carpenters out there among you know that the wood glue is probably stronger than the black walnut anyway. I'm only gluing one side.
there's no correct way. There are literally dozens of ways that I can do this. I'm just trying to make it more organic than I did on the bandsaw by trying to take that kink away. You could use a sander or a utility knife or whatever you want. Almost there. There are a lot of steps between here and finished. So I can't show you everything, but I can just keep it to the concept-based stuff. Remember what I said about establishing your skeleton, your overall shape, and then you just move on to the smaller details. Before I move on to this corner shaping, I want to point something out about using a sander. With a shape like this, we have lots of curves. Now, if you look at the top curve, there's a place where the convex becomes the concave. At that imaginary place, it's called an inflection point. At least, that's what they call it in mathematics. So, what does an inflection point have to do with sanding? Well, a convex curve can be sanded right up to the inflection point on a disc sander. But you can't go beyond that because you'll be cutting in to the conca concave portion of it. And similarly, a belt sander or a drum sander are both really effective at doing these concave portions, but you don't want to move it past the point of inflection and into a convex bit because it can put a little round divot into your work. Take a look at this top part. I still have to give it another curve by subtracting a little bit here to make its shoulder a little more wedge-like so that as it fits in, the top part tapers into that little hole. I wasn't kidding about the utility knife. Before you think about lecturing me on how wrong I am, remember that this video isn't about how you would use a spoke shape to shape this. It's about how I did use a utility knife to shape, to shape this. And besides, to be perfectly honest, If you can't shape a piece of wood with a knife, then you shouldn't be using an axe anyways. I like to move between tools. I remove a bit here or remove a bit there. There are no rules. I can't emphasize that enough. But there are procedures. Notice the way that I'm holding my knife. I'm cutting away from myself and I use two hands. I push with this thumb as I cut. I also try to make kind of a circular motion with each knife stroke. There's also another aspect of whitt whittling that's helpful when you're making something out of wood. And that's that you start to develop kind of an, an intuitive understanding for the material that you're working with. And that might just, it makes your intuitions more correct so if you jump in using a different tool, 
you're less likely to make a mistake. So think of it as getting a feel or kicking the tires in a different life. I was what you might call an artist and while learning to use the potter's wheel I quickly discovered that whenever you want to control your hands it's very important to connect them. You want to keep your hands together. Both hands should be as one hand. What's he talking about? Well, look, this hand is only as stable as it is, but when you join it with another hand, it makes it much more stable. So whenever you're doing anything with your hands, try to balance them against one another. Any way in which you can connect one hand to another adds to your stability, and that equals consistency, and that equals work quality. Now, if you don't mind, I'm sorry to say this requires concentration, and I can do without the distraction right now, so I'm putting you away. I just sat over by the fire doing it for about a half of an hour. It's been far too long for me. It's actually quite enjoyable to do this. I've established all of my curves, and now I just have to sand them down. Almost there. At this point, I really don't want to mess it up because it's becoming nice. <laughs> well, take a look at this. I still have to narrow it down to get it to fit that. And as I've said, this will be its weak spot. But as long as I can get that to fit nicely, it'll pass. I'm putting it on backwards because it's bigger on the top side. So that allows me to approach my target slowly and it's making marks where I need to take away some more material still. This collateral damage down here that the sander is making it's nothing to worry about. I'll just blend it out after I can fit the axe head on. I still want to do some light chisel work to it, so I used the cutoffs from the bandsaw to make vice jaws. This is just a piece of scrap leather to use as a shim to get it nice and tight. The video might be dragging on at this point, but trust me, so is the project. This is the most tedious part. Polyethylene. Let's have a look. I've taken a hair too much there, and a hair not enough there. I also have to start to make an adjustment to this curve so that it matches my axe head. Nothing personal, but you're standing a bit close. 
Lots of fine tuning. Why do I not use a rasp? Because a rasp is crude and I prefer to have more control. Sometimes a rasp can dig in too much and make tears in the grain where you don't really expect it to make tears. This is a more elegant solution for fine tuning. It's just a piece of quarter inch steel rod with some 100 grit sandpaper on it. And what we absolutely do not want here is a, a crease or a kink. We want a nice smooth transition so that it can remain wedge-like. And just to compare up close, this is a rasp. So, of course, there's nothing wrong with using a rasp earlier in the process, but this is way too late in the game for that. Now some minor chisel work to remove the tight spots here and here, and then I'll be ready to set this. I hand sanded it down to 220. In other words, I used 100 grit and 220. That's all I used, and that's as far as I'm going. Any more than that would be a bit excessive for a hatchet, as I think you'll see in the next step. This product calls itself teak oil, which is kind of a nebulous term, but its properties are very similar to that of boiled linseed oil. It can be reapplied as often as you like. As for this, you can drive yourself crazy getting all the scratches out of it. That will be good enough for me. In fact, if I got it any better, you'd be able to identify me. Next up, we make the hickory wedge. For the sake of strength, if it's at all possible, I want to eliminate any gap here. I'll use wood glue and hopefully that will push glue down in and eliminate any gap at all. But up here at the top, for the sake of both strength and appearance, I'm going to flare the topmost part of my shim out just a little bit. Ideally, you have no gap at all anywhere, but if you have to have it somewhere, I uh, choose the middle. Okay, I admit, this level of scrutiny is excessive for a hatchet. But I like to wear different hats every now and then. Okay, this is still a great trick for fitting a wedge. Just put it in just on the edge and you'll be able to tell if it's correct or not. It doesn't quite fit on the top, but I can persuade it in with a hammer. This is just a piece of scrap leather and a chunk of 2x4. The head of this wooden mallet is basswood if I remember correctly. At some point I even got bored enough to wood burn a little ship on there. This is an extremely soft wood so it's not going to destroy this too bad.
probably made it a bit too tight. Tried to be too perfect. But that's okay. It's set pretty well. It's not going to go anywhere. Conclusions. It's beautiful, but it's a novelty. Let's be honest, this was a junk axe and I turned it into something else that is really more about the object than it is about the work the object can do. And that's fine, as long as we're honest about that fact. It ended up with a not so bad edge just as a result of all the sanding but I really need to stone a proper edge on it if I want to use this for anything. But this video has gone on long enough, so I have to end it here. I hope you found this in some way interesting or useful. Videos like this can be a little bit misleading because it can make you believe that this is harder than it actually is. In reality, wood's just not that difficult to shape. And also handles are temporary, so it's a work in progress. I may still thin it down a little bit by removing some material from the chest, you know, the front of the handle. But my one conclusion for certain is that next time this shows up at a flea market, it will get the full four dollars. See you next time. Alright, my conclusions. <laughs>